Catastrophic storms, catastrophic impact. April 27, 2011, more than 200 deaths across the state. Less than a year later, tornadoes slammed the area again. Three counties are declared federal disaster areas. Right now, families and businesses are still cleaning up. With the start of tornado season just weeks away, are you prepared? ABC 3340 and Chief Meteorologist James Spann want to help keep you safe. From Centerpoint High School in Jefferson County, Alabama, we proudly present Storm Alert 2012. Do you have a plan? This is James Spann with a special televised version of Storm Alert 2012. Thank you for taking the time to watch this afternoon. The program today is all about the severe weather warning process in Alabama. Quite frankly, the loss of life has been catastrophic across our state in the last year. And quite frankly, since I've started doing the weather on television here in the late 70s. There's just been too much loss of life on my watch. Last year, April 27th, in one day, the death toll, 252. This year, about one month ago, right here where we are, we had loss of life in Clay and Center Point and also on the other side of Jefferson County and Oak Grove. So we thought it'd be appropriate to sit down and spend 30 minutes with you and talk about the warning process, how it works and what you need to do to properly respond and that the spring tornado season is right around the corner. What we're going to talk about today is simply this. Do you have a plan? Everybody has a part to play in the severe weather warning process. We do and you do as well. It's a three-point process. Number one, everybody, and I mean everybody in the state, has to have a way of getting severe weather watches and severe weather warnings. And we'll discuss that today. Number two, you've got to have a place to go. You've got to have an action plan. Where do you go? What do you do? Depending on where you live. And the third Third point is having a kit, a supply kit that will be ready in the event a tornado does strike. Ask anybody that's gone through one of these. Having that kit was absolutely crucial for those that did. But where we are now at center point, and on January 23rd, an EF3 tornado rolled through here, part of yet another severe weather outbreak in Alabama. Our chief photographer, Bill Castle, will take us back and we'll take a look at uh, where we were back in January. Well, I heard the noise about 3 o'clock this morning, and uh, I got my son by the bed, and we were about to rush downstairs. High winds of approximately 80 to 90 to 100 miles an hour. Um, vehicles, when I opened up my back door, uh, actually in my bedroom, you could see when we lost power, lights spinning. And uh, as I went to the back door and I opened the back door, I ripped it out of my hand, and it was vehicles. Uh, in the funnel cloud. I started knocking out a lot of my windows at my house. It was just a huge roar. Um, just an eerie, roary, you know, things hitting the house and, you know, not really being able to see what was going on, but just hearing it. All of a sudden, our ears started popping. The house literally lifted up, turned, and then came crashing down on top of us. And all of a sudden, just glass exploded in the house and was flying everywhere. And, uh, my daughter come up from, she, she's got a room in the basement, and we have a guy living upstairs, and he came down, and then we heard over at the Heichelbecks, their son was crying for, help me, help me, somebody, somebody help me. So my, my daughter went over there and hugged them. We just hugged them, and then we went around back, and Dad was, he was trying to pull stuff out of the swimming pool because that's where he thought his daughter was because he got blown into the pool along with his son. Well, you see the house, it was just, it, it just raked the whole house into the backyard and into the woods. And that, he was in the pool and he figured maybe she'd be there too, but she wasn't. We, there was a, many people from the neighborhood came down and we were scurrying through the woods. It's raining, it's pitch black out. And all of a sudden I looked back at the house and there was, all these lights. So I came back to the house and they had found her. They had picked her out of the rubble and they were performing CPR on her. And she was dead. First time I've been really in a tornado that passed over me and I you could hear it go over, but just the, the sound of the water getting pulled out of all the plumbing is what stuck in my mind. You see tornadoes and you see the, the aftermath of it. But until you've been this close to one, you don't really get it. 
and it's the noise and the explosion. I, just, I couldn't believe it. As uh, the storm went away, the first thing I did was pray with my wife and to let her know that I love her and that I'm thankful that we're here. We thanking God today. Tornadoes are nothing new to the state of Alabama. We have had them here for a long, long time, and we've had probably more tornadoes than you might imagine. A lot of people around the nation think Tornado Alley consists of Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas, as you see here. But some recent studies have been done suggesting that the highest frequency of killer tornadoes, it's actually in this region, from Memphis to Birmingham. And I guess part of the reason that we don't get the publicity the planes get is the fact that so many of our tornadoes you can't see. They are obscured by rain. Many of our tornadoes happen in the middle of the night, like the tornadoes last month. And many of the tornadoes here are obscured by trees and terrain. This is a beautiful state, but you simply can't see our tornadoes that easily. In fact, there's been some absolutely fascinating research that's come out. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is research that shows the number of violent, long-track tornadoes. And this goes back to approximately 1950, and the results from that analysis you see on that map indicate that Dixie Alley, that's the alley where we are, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, we have the highest frequency of long-track EF3 and EF5 tornadoes making it the most active region in the United States. The bottom line is we have more violent long-track tornadoes than Oklahoma and Kansas, where you think that might be the case. So it's just something to think about. It's nothing to brag on. We don't want to brag on that, but the truth is we have tornadoes here quite frequently, and that's something we're going to talk about tonight. Now, uh, that is me right there. I am a child of the 1970s, all right? Uh, and I want to go back and look at Alabama weather history. Uh, that was when I was a senior in high school in 1974 in Tuscaloosa, back when I actually had hair. And that's what really got me into this. And I want to go back and look at the decade of the 70s because this is another reminder of how violent tornadoes can be here. The first tornado damage I ever saw in my life was May 27th, 1973. The image you see there, that is a community Brent in southwest uh, or southwest of Birmingham in Bibb County. An EF4 tornado killed five people, including a man at the Brent Baptist Church by the name of Andrew Mitchell on a Sunday night. It was absolutely horrible, and, and that changed my life. I'll never forget that night. I'll never forget the damage, the eerie darkness, the odd scent. To this day, we don't exactly know what it is. By many of the first responders, it is called the scent of death. But for the ones that live around here, this is the one that you would remember. The same day, Center Point was hit by this tornado that tracked all the way from Center Point up into St. Clair County on the other side of Asheville. These are some newspaper clippings from that tornado, May 27th, 1973, where we are here. One person was killed and 76 people were injured in that tornado that hit center point that evening. And going back to the 70s, the death toll has been quite staggering. On that event, May 27th to 73, we had six people that lost their life. The next year, the super outbreak, April 3rd, 4th, 1974, 80 people were killed statewide. Ewan was almost wiped out. And again, that was my senior year in high school. I was allowed off school for a few days and I volunteered as a ham radio operator in some of the hardest hit areas. What I saw after that event changed my life. I lost my innocence when it came to storms and I am a child of the super outbreak. The next year my hometown was hit Tuscaloosa the 23rd of February 1975. A lady was killed up on the Scottish Inn on the second floor that was working there. We had a bad tornado outbreak in March 1976. Thankfully nobody died but 1977 Smithfield Estates April 4th 22 people died up in the northern part of Birmingham and unfortunately a lot of what we're seeing now is reminiscent of the 70s and I'm not saying we're going to have this type of activity over the next three or four years, but it's possible. It seems to come in cycles. Our most active tornado decades in, in the state were the 30s, the 50s, and the 70s, and here we are now with active weather once again. So this is nothing new. This is where we expect to have severe weather and tornadoes, but we have to be ready for when this happens. From Storm Alert 2012, do you have a plan? A live town hall meeting at Center Point High School in Jefferson County, Alabama. Join the discussion on Facebook at ABC 3340 and on Twitter at at hashtag WX plan. Many of our tornadoes in Alabama happen late at night or during the pre-dawn hours. And you have to have a very effective way of getting the warning. 
A lot of people have had a haphazard approach to that, but that's got to change. I want to go back and look at the tornado that came through here and the warning process, how it worked on January 23rd. This package is from Bryant Somerville. The night before he took it off, he said he was too hot, which isn't like him. He loves his onesies. Every child has a name. He had on his little pull up in his helmet. Every name has a meaning. You just want to protect your children. And that meaning usually stems from something that hits close to home with the parents. I was in mommy mode. I wasn't panicking at that moment. When Alana Cheetah gives birth to Twister in about a month's time, rest assured his name has meaning. Going from Roebuck to Pinson, comes to Huffman and Centerpoint. And they had been warning us that there was going to be bad weather. These are the communities that are in the path of what could be a pretty significant tornado. It was just a rumble. Everybody out here needs to be in a safe place. That's louder than thunder. Need to take cover that it is coming right up Centerpoint Parkway. It sounds like a train, like it's literally right by. It wasn't like 10 seconds and it was over, but it was like the worst sound you'll ever hear. It's 3 a.m., January 23rd. Cheetah is awake, sitting in her bedroom with her two children, four-year-old Talon and two-year-old Josiah. Keep in mind, she's also eight months pregnant. A very well-defined hook. Watching weather reports on TV, she knows something vicious is headed her way. Danger. Like, just danger. It's all she says she felt, but yet, oddly enough, she says she was at ease. After all, she says she had watched meteorologist James Spann days before warning of the severe weather. It's not like a warning that you have from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning. He had given us that warning a few days before even. Okay, there's going to be some bad weather. And now that bad weather was knocking on her front door. She says one of the first things she thought of, helmets. They're motorcycle, full face motorcycle helmets. Acting fast, she grabbed her boys, one in each arm. She herself didn't even have time to put on pants. If I had been any faster getting to their rooms and getting their helmets, if I had been any slower, it just, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have added up right. At this point, she says she was running on the only thing she could, mommy mode. After getting the helmets, she knew the next step was getting to her basement. He's like, no, mommy, it's dark. I said, no, we need to go now. We started going down steps and you could feel the air and you could hear the air being sucked out of the basement. Halfway down the steps, her ears started popping and she could feel herself losing her balance. Keep in mind, she's eight months pregnant. If I could, I would have jumped from my top step all the way to the bottom step. Staying calm, she got herself and her three children to the basement safely. I know now that, you know, whenever he says to just go to your safe place, how hard is that to do? You know, it's not. Get your kids up because you don't have time. Oh, it is crossed over the center point area. Once the storm was over, they crawled out of their basement's side door. We got out barefoot. You know, they didn't have, well, one of them didn't have his PJs on. He had on a helmet. He didn't have on anything else. Looking back, she knows they were lucky. You don't even think of it being that bad whenever it's happening until you see the aftermath. And then you're like, how did I survive through that? She doesn't know what kept her alive. Perhaps mother's intuition, maybe quick thinking, maybe she says even James Spann. Huffman, center point, all right, Tarrant, be in a safe place. As for her home, it's destroyed. Years of memories, not only for her, but her children, gone. There's not much that we could salvage but we did the best we could. After all, everyone is safe. Dangerous heck. Four-year-old Talon, two-year-old Josiah, and even Twister. Look at that. Who she says one day will understand the meaning behind his name. In Centerpoint, Bryant Somerville, ABC 3340. And we are so thankful you made it through the storm. You and your family, what a story. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, let's talk about the warning process. Um, a lot of you have probably seen this image, the old Uncle Sam James Spann shot. That's been floating around the web for a while. But this year, we've decided to get serious about it. 
It is my opinion that the siren mentality has killed dozens, if not hundreds, of Alabamians. I don't know what it is. There's the notion that we have in our state, and quite frankly in many states across tornado-prone regions, that you should hear an outdoor warning siren before a tornado. And the truth is that's not going to happen in 98% of the cases. Uh, I am old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis of the 60s. I was a little boy living at the time in a small community in South Alabama. They, they taught us a certain blast meant that the missiles were coming in from Cuba, a certain blast meant that the missiles were coming in from the Soviet Union. And even then I was thinking, well, I can't hear this in my house. What good will it do? We couldn't hear it in the school. And here we are in 2012 relying on these as a way of getting information. And occasionally I've been so frustrated, I've been tempted to say, let's just take them down, and quite frankly, I have, and I know that's not right. They do serve a purpose. Sirens reach a limited number of people outdoors. And if we can have a device like that that reaches five or ten more people, let's keep them. But what we have to do is remind everybody that that should never, ever, ever, ever be your first way of getting a severe weather watch or especially a severe weather warning. You cannot hear them effectively inside a home, a church, a school, or a business. They have never, ever been designed for that, although some people tend to use them that way. So we want to offer you a three-tiered approach on this, uh, maybe three different ideas. Go straight to the 3340 website, and if you go to abc3340.com, you'll see these three options. We're suggesting Weather Call, which is up here at the top right. We're suggesting IMAP Weather Radio, which is a phone app we'll discuss. And then NOAA Weather Radio. Quite frankly, that is the baseline. Everybody in this state should have a NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA stands for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Weather radios are not radios that play commercial radio stations. You cannot turn on the radio and hear music. You can turn on a weather radio and hear weather information 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The broadcast are from the National Weather Service. But here's the beauty of these things. The Weather Service will encode a digital burst when there's a tornado warning for your county, and that will sound the alarm in that radio, and it will wake you up. Most weather radio models will wake up the dead in the middle of the night. It will do what a siren cannot do, and they are programmable. Years and years ago, when weather radio first came into play in the 70s, they were analog, and you would get multiple counties, and it would go off all the time. They're now digital. You can pick one county. If all you want is one county, that is all you'll get. They're programmable by county codes. So what you do when you buy that weather radio, you program in the county code and be sure it's in the right frequency. And we understand that can be a little challenging. So what we have done is make the incentive to go around the state programming weather radios free at Publix locations. We have been to a lot already. We have a lot to go through March. So that is the baseline. Every family should have a weather radio. Uh, Publix is a great place to buy them. Many other retailers have them. You can buy them online. But they're inexpensive. They are under $30. That's your baseline. Now, let's talk about IMAP Weather Radio. Uh, I have actually, that app is on my iPad here, and you can see what it looks like. Uh, this is coming straight off the app, and here's the beauty of this. The IMAP Weather Radio application not only lets you program in fixed locations, but it knows where you are. These things have a global positioning chip. And accordingly, if you are in a polygon warning, you get the warning. And if you're not, you don't. In addition, you can see uh, weather information, you can see radar information, and the beautiful thing about this is the fact that you can actually watch our on-air storm coverage. Uh, you can see right now, that's our live stream that's coming straight off this application. And during times of severe weather, we would have our long-form tornado coverage on there. And that's one thing I want to stress here is the fact that warnings are now based on polygons, not counties. Tornadoes are tiny, counties are huge. Back in the old days, the entire county was warned. But now just a small part of the county is warned. It makes the warning process so much better. And that app, IMAP Weather Radio, it's based on the polygons. Let's say there's a tornado warning in effect for Bessemer. That tornado will be nowhere close to Clay or Center Point. There's no reason for you to get the alarm up here and vice versa. If there's a tornado in Warrior, if you're in Hoover, you don't need to get the warning. That is a wonderful example of where this whole thing needs to go. So if you have a smartphone, it is called IMAP, I-M-A-P, Weather Radio, 
and you can download that. Now, for the moment, it's for iPhone and iPad only. The Android version should be out around March 1st. They're coding that as quickly as they can. It is a wonderful app, and again, the beauty of that is the fact that you can watch our live tornado coverage, so while you're in your safe place, whether it's a closet, a hall, a bathroom, uh, a basement, you can watch. You don't have to have the sound blared up from the television from such a long distance away. So that's IMAP Weather Radio. And then the third option we offer is one called Weather Call. Quite frankly, a lot of you watching this program right now, you don't have a fancy phone. You don't like cell phones, you don't like smartphones, you don't like technology. Well, this might be the best option for you. This will call your home phone and let you know that there's a tornado warning. In fact, it's me that called you. Of course, it's a recorded voice. And again, just like the IMAP weather radio app, this is based on polygons. Uh, there's a good example up on the screen right now. Uh, in that case, there's a polygon warning for parts of Tuscaloosa, Walker, and Jefferson counties. Notice a tiny sliver of Jefferson. I mean a sliver is under the tornado warning. So if you are in Birmingham or Clay or Center Point or Bessemer or Hoover or, Pel or Pelham or anywhere, you won't get the warning because you're not close. But maybe if you live in Seri or Warrior, yes, you get the warning because you're in the polygon and it's absolutely beautiful. Now, Weather Call calls your home phone. It works like a charm. A lot of you still are using landlines, and it is a very reliable way of getting the information. To sign up, you do it right off the ABC 3340 website, and it's very inexpensive. The service is just pennies a month, and maybe if you have a fancy app on your phone, maybe this would be a good choice for your mom or your dad or your parents. So it's called Weather Call, and that's one of those three options. So again, the three options we're recommending that everybody in the state should have. Number one, your baseline, it's a NOAA weather radio. Everybody should have one of those, period. Number two, if you got a smartphone, IMAP weather radio. It's an app right now for iPhone and iPad, but within a few weeks it will be available for Android. And then weather call, that is for any home phone. Or it works on a cell phone as well. But again, the nice thing about weather call is the fact that it's based on the polygons. We've got to move away from that siren mentality. I don't know when the next tornado will be, but the loss of life in this state has been tragic. Time and time and time again, we hear these words coming from those that have lost loved ones. I never heard a siren. It happened in the middle of the night and they had no chance of hearing it to start with. We've got to move away from the siren mentality, and I promise the death toll will go dramatically lower in this state. Now, coming up next, we're going to talk about the third part of this plan, the second and the third part, involving knowing where you're going and having a kit. That's all coming up as our live edition of Storm Alert 2012 continues from Centerpoint High School. You know the basic rules. You've heard me say this over and over and over and over again during severe weather. Small room, hall, closet, bathroom, lowest floor, near the center, away from windows. And in 99 out of 100 cases, you are fine if you do that. There are rare EF5 tornadoes where you must be underground, but those are so rare, they're not worth worrying about. Now, for those of you in mobile homes, you have to leave. It's a different situation. You have to have a place to go, whether it's the middle of the day, middle of the night, weekend, or weekday. Mobile homes, you must leave and have a shelter. This should all be part of your family plan. And when you pick that spot, whether it's if you're living in a mobile home, it's a few miles down the road, or if you're in a site-built house, if it's your basement or a bathroom, the kids need to know that. A lot of times, older kids might be home alone and severe weather happens, and they need to know as well. So be sure the entire family knows. And the one thing we recommend is having a kit. We have a large list up on our website at abc3340.com, and I'm not going to go through all of this here on television today, but take some time to look at that. And the one thing I want to stress, it's a helmet. Uh, you've heard this a lot in recent weeks, and I'll stress it again. Helmets are very important. Uh, they do save lives. A very important piece of research came out of UAB about three weeks ago, letting us know what we've been saying is true. It does work. So go to abc3340.com for that full list. Now, let's go and take a look at how this community is doing one month later. Here's Ebony Hall. Renee Davis remembers January 23rd. The weather we were watching zoomed in and said, you know, it looks like it's going to go across Chalkville here, and it zoomed in on our street. So I told my husband, I said, we've got to get up. They quickly made it to their safe place. He barely made it in the room. He pulled the door to, and as soon as the latch clicked, our house exploded. The home is now unlivable, like many of the others. 
This is the lot next door. Davis says a two story house used to sit there and now the top story of that house is on a hill across the street. She tells us her neighbors are not coming back. And of course, that leads to concerns about property values and uncertainty about just what the future holds for this neighborhood. Davis says their next move really depends on what their insurance is willing to pay. As you go up in value of house, the value of the property increases mm -hmm. significantly, so it's, it's, you know, we're, it's out of our reach. So we don't so. know what we're going to do. In Center Point, it's estimated that 35% of storm survivors had no insurance at all. They are depending on FEMA. Contractor Billy Luttrell has crews working on various projects right now. Mostly emergency tarps and uh, emergency roofs. We've done a couple where we had to build temporary structures just to house a tarp because there was no joists, no rafters, nothing to hold the tarps in place. Temporary fixes on the way to long-term recovery. We seem to be making progress. Center Point Mayor Tom Henderson says the next step is to hire a company to remove the remaining debris. We've already moved about approximately 12,000 cubic yards of, of uh, vegetative debris. Probably have another 40 to 50,000 to go. Center Point's business district took a hit too. Accounting firm McNaughton and Associates had been located in this strip mall, but within just days after the tornado, the business was able to move to another location without losing any files, just as tax season kicks into high gear. Well, it's very important because uh, it being our busy time of year, and uh, you know, we, we were set up and we were actually doing tax returns on Friday of that same week. So. Recovery is underway. It is all a part of the process of making people whole, restoring what's been destroyed, and maybe returning items lost. For Davis, this work will be important as she and her family learn from this storm and prepare for the next. I never thought this would happen to us. Never. Ebony Hall, ABC 3340. Mayor Tom Henderson is with us live now, and Mayor Henderson, it's been a rough ride, but it looks like you've come a long way in less than one month. We have. We had uh, very good support from the first responders. They were out very quickly in Alabama Power and Jefferson County helping get the roads cleared so we could get uh, help into the neighborhoods that needed the help. How have the businesses recovered first, and then how have the families and people recovered? Now, the businesses, uh, a good many of them are back in business. Uh, they had some damage to roofs and so forth, but we had 17 that were totaled. Wow. And uh, it's going to be a while before they can get back operating again. How about the residents, the folks that had home damage here? Um, we probably had 350 homes damaged, uh, maybe 100, 125 or so that were maybe totaled. But uh, the residents seem to have a very good attitude and they're, they're working to come back and I think we'll, we'll uh, recover and be back better than ever. And I think maybe for a lot of us, some of the hardest video to watch was of the beautiful new elementary school. Right. How are the kids doing? They're doing well. They've moved to the elementary, uh, Irwin Elementary and Irwin uh, Middle School, and they brought in some, uh, the county has brought in some trailers for them, and uh, they seem to be uh, working very well. But as I looked at the stats, Center Point did not have any loss of life that morning, which no is pretty remarkable. No loss of life. We're very happy about that. Any specific needs you have as a community before we go here? Well, we need uh, continuing volunteers to come in. We, we get that a lot. If somebody wants to help, what do they need to do? Okay, there's a setup at First Baptist Church in Center Point. Uh, the Lutheran organization has taken volunteers' names and also names of people who need help there uh, so that volunteers can be sent out to their properties to help out. And I also need to emphasize that anybody that's had property damage or any damage needs to go register with FEMA whether you think you'll get it or not, whether you had insurance or not. Well, Mayor Henderson, thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us today, and we want you to stay with okay. us for a few more moments, and here's what's going to happen. For those of you on the television side, we're going to, in just a moment, join ABC's World News Tonight Weekend Edition, but we are going to continue this on our live stream and on our digital channel, James Span 24-7. So if you want to kind of get involved in the interactive part of this program, ask some questions via Twitter or Facebook, or maybe listen to some of the questions we have here, go over to abc3340.com for the live stream.
stream on your computer or your digital device, or if you have a, a James Span 24-7 on your cable system, uh, the next part of this will air on there as well. So for those of you on ABC 3340, thank you for taking the time to watch, and please think about the things we talked about today. Have a way of getting the warning. That have a place to go and know, be sure all the kids know and be sure that the family knows. And number three, had that kit. All of this is up on the website as well. So on behalf of all of our staff here, thank you very much for watching. We now join ABC's World News Tonight, the weekend edition in progress.